There was never boat upon the sea so tossed up and down by the waves as was Psyche's mind that day by contrary emotions. Her inmost soul recoiled from the deed that her sisters had counseled, yet how else could she save herself from a hideous death? Now she felt that she must do it, and now that she could not it was too horrible, and supposing the attempt failed. Now she thought with loathing of the serpent, and the next moment, love for her husband rushed over her like a flood. But by nightfall, her fears had conquered, and she made ready to carry out her sinful enterprise. Soon after, her husband came, and when he had kissed and embraced her, he fell asleep. Then Psyche, though half sick with dread, was nerved by the courage of despair, stealthily she drew the razor from under the pillow, slipped out of bed, and fetched the lamp that she had hidden behind a curtain. But when she stole back with the light to the bedside and looked on him who lay there, she sank on her knees, trembling and pale with amazement, and let the razor fall from her hand. For instead of a serpent, she saw a youth so divinely fair that the lamp she held burned brighter as its rays fell on him, for very joy in his beauty. It was Cupid himself, she knew instantly, and the sweet view of him held her spellbound with delight. She saw his shining, golden hair, that smelt ambrosially and paled the radiance of the lamp, his neck whiter than milk, and rose-red cheeks, his feathery wings mantling his shoulders like lustrous flowers, and fluttering as he breathed. In an ecstasy of love and joy, Psyche kissed him a thousand times, but ever so softly, lest she should break his slumber. But alas! While she was thus transported with bliss, she still held the lamp, and so unsteadily, that presently a drop of boiling oil fell on Cupid's right shoulder. At that, the god started up, and perceiving that Psyche had broken faith with him, he fled away through the window, without saying a word, but Psyche caught hold of him by the knee and clung on as he rose through the air until her strength failed and she dropped to the ground. Then Cupid flew down after her, and alighting on the top of a cypress tree he said in angry tones, Ah, foolish Psyche, was it for this I disobeyed my mother's command to give you to some base-born mate, and came myself from heaven to love you and make you my wife? Have I been with you so long, and yet could you believe it was a beast that loved you so, and planned to murder me? How often I warned you, how often I entreated you to beware of listening to those accursed counsellors. But they shall be worthily rewarded for their pains, as for you, it will be punishment enough that you have lost me. So saying, Cupid took his flight into upper air. Day was now breaking, and with straining eyes Psyche gazed after him, sobbing aloud until she could see him no longer, then in agony of mind, she rushed like a mad thing to a river that flowed nearby and flung herself in to drown. But that might not be, for the river took pity on her and gently bore up her chin, and threw her upon his grassy bank. So she rose up, and wandered along the riverside, weeping as she went. Now when she had gone a little way, she saw Pan, the goat-herd god, sitting on the bank with Canna, the nymph of the stream, and teaching her to play on a pipe of reed, while his goats browsed around them. He looked with pity on unhappy Psyche and was fain to give her some comfort, though help her he might not. For he knew under whose displeasure she was, and it is a law to the gods never to thwart one another in their dealings with mortals. So Pan would not even reveal to Psyche who it was that spoke to her. Fair maid, he said, I am but a rough herdsman, countrybred, yet being very old I have learned many things among them, some skill in that art which the wise call divination. So I can read in your uncertain gait, your pale cheeks, your sighs and tears, that you are desperately in love. Now, listen to me, for I will give you good counsel, seek not to end your life, neither weep any more, but rather worship and adore the great god Cupid, and win his favour by your devout and loving service. But though Pan dissembled thus, Psyche perceived that he was none other than the god of flocks and folds, so she answered not a word, but made humble obeisance to him, and went her way. Now all this while, the goddess Venus never doubted that her son had kept his promise, and that Psyche was miserably mated to some churl of low degree. For there was no more talk in the world about the new goddess, and all men worshipped the true Venus as of old. But it chanced that the same morning Cupid fled from Psyche, Venus went down from her palace in the Isle of Cathera to bathe in the sea. And while she was bathing there came to her the white seagull, who is the greatest gossip and telltale of all birds that fly, 
and told her that her son was wounded almost to death by a terrible burn on his shoulder. But, saving your presence, said the bird, it seems to be his own fault, for it is commonly reported that he does nothing but dally with a vile woman on the western mountains. I would not tell you this for I hate idle gossip, but that it concerns the honour of your name, which is too much slandered already, since ill-natured people do say you yourself are no better than the woman of your son's choice. Then Venus began to cry, and said, What, has my young Cupid got a sweetheart? And has she brought him into this dangerous plight? I pray you, kind and loyal bird, tell me who and what she is. Is she some nymph, or goddess, or perhaps one of the heavenly muses, or one of my own guild of graces? My lady, answered the seagull, I know not what she is, but this I know, that she is called Psyche. At that, Venus cried out indignantly, What, is it that abominable creature who dared set up for my rival and usurped my honours? Fie upon the boy, does he think I am a go-between, and only send him to the girl that he might make her his mistress? And forthwith she ran back to her house, where she found Cupid lying in an inner chamber and in great pain from his burn. For though the gods cannot die nor fall sick, they can be wounded, and then they suffer more keenly than mortals do, because their flesh is purer and, more delicate. But Venus was in too great a rage to feel the least pity for her son, and she began scolding him most furiously. You impudent, idle, good-for-nothing boy, she cried. How dared you play such a trick on your mother and sovereign lady? Did I not send you to punish my hated enemy? But instead of finding her some loathsome husband, you go courting her yourself, and intend to make the wretch my daughter-in-law, I suppose. Oh, you have a fine conceit of yourself, my lad, and think you may snap your fingers at your mother, because you are all the child she has or ever will have. Well, I have spoilt and pampered you ever since you were born, you thankless imp, and this is my reward. But you shall learn that I, who made you what you are, can unmake you, I will adopt one of my fair young priests as my son, and give him your wings, your torch, your bow, and arrows, since you dare turn them into weapons against me. Ha, ha, I will clip those gay wing feathers, and cut off those curls that I made more lustrous than gold, it will do my heart good to see the sorry figure you will be then, Master Cupid. So saying, Venus flung out of the chamber in a towering rage and locked the door after her. Now just then the goddesses Juno and Sears came to visit her, and they asked what had happened to put her in such a passion. I think you know very well, replied Venus, and have come on purpose to condole with me on my son's wicked behaviour. I am ashamed to talk of it, but, if you would do me a kindness, pray help me to find a girl called Psyche, who has turned vagabond and is roaming about the world. Juno and Sears had in truth heard the whole story, and as they much wished to keep friends with Cupid whose arrows were feared by even the greatest gods, they began to make all the excuses they could for him. Come, Lady Venus, said Juno, it is no such great crime, surely, for your son to fall in love. What else, could you expect, now that he is grown up? Why, you seem to forget that he is no longer a child. At his age, it is only natural that his fancy should turn to a maiden, why should you be so offended and vow vengeance on her he loves? Let us entreat you to pardon him, and take him back to favour. Pray do so, gentle Venus, said Sears, and let young Cupid be happy with this bride he has chosen. It will be a strange thing indeed, and ill taken by gods and men, if you that sow the seed of love in every heart forbid the joys of it to your own son. What, must he be punished for practising the sweet art that he learnt from you, its sole mistress? But Venus was not to be pacified by either of them, she fancied they meant to affront her, and was secretly mocking at her injuries, so in sullen mood she broke off the talk, saying she must visit her temple in Cyprus. Which she did, and stayed there a while nursing her wrath. As for Cupid, he lay on his bed many days, tormented by his wound and grieving for the loss of Psyche, whom he loved as dearly as ever. His one comfort was, her two wicked sisters were already punished, as they deserved. For the same hour he left her, he had flown to the eldest sister's house and appeared to her in Psyche's likeness, all pale and dishevelled. What has happened, girl? cried the eldest sister, astonished, and how did you get here so quickly? Alas, sister, said the pretended Psyche, 
I did as you bade me, but, when I brought the lamp to the bedside, I saw my husband was no serpent, it was Cupid himself that lay there asleep. I trembled so, that I spilled a drop of hot oil on his shoulder, and he awoke and saw the razor in my hand. Out of my sight, murderous, he cried, in a terrible rage, for I renounce and cast you off forever. I will take another wife, more worthy and far more beautiful than you, even your eldest sister. Go and tell her so, and bid her come to reign here in your stead. And straightway I was caught up by Zephyrus and wafted hither. Alas, alas, dear sister, what will become of me now? Unless you help me, I must beg my bread from door to door. Yes, that you must, said the eldest sister, for I will have nothing to do with you, foolish and wicked girl. Fie on you, to think of murdering your own husband. Away and beg, but not here, or I will set the dogs on you. And she drove her seeming sister from the door with threats and curses. Then with all haste, she took ship to the west and climbed the mountain, and crying out, Oh, Cupid, here is the bride meat for thee. Now, Zephyrus, receive thy mistress, she flung herself down the precipice. But as no Zephyrus received her, she was instantly dashed in pieces. Immediately afterward came the second sister and perished in like manner. For Cupid had appeared to her in the same guise and told her the same tale, whereupon she also drove away Psyche as she thought, and hastened to the mountain, and leapt down. And that was the end of these two wicked princesses.